The next bill on the calendar for the day is House uh, Senate File 4097. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> Senate file number 4097, number four on the calendar for the day, an act relating to commerce, the second engrossment. Representative Stevenson, before you explain your bill, do you want to put the House language into your bill? Thank you, Madam Speaker, yes. The clerk will report the amendment. Stevenson moves to amend Senate file number 4097, the second engrossment. The amendment is coded DEA 4077. To the author of the amendment, Representative Stephen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, members, I wouldn't dare bring Senate language into this chamber. We need to get the House language in, and then we'll have a good debate about the bill. There's an amendment at the desk. Oh, we have to vote. <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed signify by saying nay. The motion prevails, and the amendment is adopted. Representative Stephen, to present your bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, this bill is the Commerce Policy uh, Bill. Members, we had a great uh, Commerce Committee this year with members from both sides doing phenomenal work and bringing forward a number of great policy bills that are included in this uh, bill, bills from both sides of the aisle. I want to thank all of the members of the committee for the great conversation we had today, and particularly um, Representative O'Driscoll for his uh, work uh, helping me with this uh, committee this year. This bill includes a number of really important provisions, um, and we'll start with something that has been a bipartisan uh, effort to put some real guardrails about social media and the impact that's having uh, on people uh, in our country today, in our state today, and particularly young people. And this bill takes a real groundbreaking approach um, to tackling that problem. Uh, we also have some uh, really great provisions in here designed to help people deal with uh, debt uh, and uh, making sure that our, our laws and, uh, around uh, debt are, are fair and treat consumers with respect. And thanks to Representative Ryer for her uh, important work um, on that. Um, we also do have some important telecom provisions here, including a bill that I've cared a long time about, which is uh, related to net neutrality. Um, but overall, this is a great mix of bills that solves a lot of problems that Minnesotans are facing and provides some good consumer protections, and I look forward to a robust debate. Yep. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Stevenson moves to amend Senate file number 4097, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A16. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This amendment removes uh, three provisions from the bill, two of which, uh, the House file 1989 from Chair Moeller and uh, House file 38. 3438 from Representative Greenman, uh, we passed a standalone measures last week. The third of which is a provision uh, from Chair Freiberg, House File 4182, related to broadband and allowing for franchise agreements on, on broadband. And I th this was a really uh, novel approach to a problem uh, that uh, a lot of communities are facing around uh, regulating broadband and making sure that we're um, taking care of the right of way and also supporting our public affairs programming. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about this bill, um, and I think there still needs to be some more work done uh, before it's uh, ready to be finally enacted. So we're going to take it out uh, of the bill today and allow for con that continued discussion. And certainly want to thank uh, Chair Freiberg for his great work uh, getting us uh, this far, and we'll keep working on this one. Discussion to the Stevenson Amendment. The member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, Chair Stevenson, thank you for recognizing what would have been my 13A amendment. Um, I almost kind of feel like you were copying my homework a little bit here um, when I brought the 13A amendment forward. You indicated there's a little bit more work that needs to be done in this bill. I would say there's a lot more work that needs to be done in this bill, like a big DE, delete everything amendment, and that's what you bring forward next time. This bill would have brought in an 8% increase in any kind of broadband service to folks, and I will have more to, to, to say about that later on. But at this point, I want to thank you for your willingness to uh, take this out because this is not what Minnesotans need right now is a fee or tax increase um, on their internet and broadband services. So thank you, Mr. Um, Chair and Madam Speaker. Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. No. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. 
There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Novotny moves to amend Senate file number 4097, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A7. To the representative from Sherburn, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this is a highly technical, very advanced uh, amendment that moves a quotation mark. When we uh, brought the bill to the committee, there was a suggestion from the Auto Owners Association just to clean up some language. And according to the uh, representative from the Auto Owners Association, they've been waiting 20 years for someone to bring up this bill so that they could suggest moving these quotation marks. And that's what that bill does. I have spoke with the author. Uh, this is considered a friendly amendment. Thank you, Chair. Further discussion, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Novotny, for the amendment and for the underlying bill, which is a very good bill. I was glad to include in this omnibus. I encourage members to vote yes. There being no further discussion, all those... Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the uh, chair taking this and the bill author taking this provision. I would certainly hate to have to have a long, prolonged debate and a roll call on such a technical issue. So thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Representative Driscoll, did you say you wanted a roll call? Or? <laughs> um, apparently, Representative Nash does. He's the only one in the chamber. I said um, pro prohibiting us from having to uh, have such a long debate and a roll call on such a minor provision. So I thank the bill author for taking that provision. Any further discussion in case I overlook somebody again? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Hamilton Yeager moves to amend Senate file number 4097. The second of Grossman as amended. The amendment is coded A6. To the member from Washington, Representative Hamilton Yeager. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the A6 basically came about because uh, independently, Senator McEwen and I each had constituents uh, that were being scammed through the use of virtual currency kiosks. And this bill and this amendment um, came about as a result of a lot of work working together with the Senate, uh, my former LA Alex Wheeler, working with Representative Niska, and as well as uh, industry people from the virtual currency kiosk industry and local police departments. Uh, this part of the bill allows for protections for people using virtual currency kiosks by defining new and existing users. It clarifies disclosures um, that need to be displayed on the screen and acknowledged, and it adds a process for people to get their money back and be a little bit more whole um, when they become a victim of a scam, and I would appreciate your support. Discussion to the amendment. The member from Anoka, Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and th thank you, Representative Yeager, or Hemmings and Yeager, for your uh, work on this uh, on this bill and on this issue. Um, I did uh, have a conversation with some of the industry folks, uh, and and they. Uh, also reinforce the excellent work that you've done in terms of uh, getting together, first of all, dealing with a real issue, an emerging technology issue that needs to be dealt with. Uh, there's serious potential for, for scams in this area, That's uh, and, and it's, a, it's a real problem. And uh, you did a great job of listening to a lot of different perspectives and incorporating a lot of stuff in a short period of time. And so I appreciate the conversations we've had on this and the work that you've done on this. I don't think this is a, we're at a perfect spot yet. I'm sure that there will be more discussions in coming years, but this is a really good start on a really difficult uh, emerging issue. And so I appreciate the work that you've done on that and urge members to support the amendment. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. <coughs> the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Finky moves to amend Senate file number 4097, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A11. To the member from Ramsey, Representative Finky. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this is a religious exemption amendment for the gender affirming care coverage provision. It is the same language we passed last year for the contraceptive uh, coverage, and we just want to make sure we have consistent religious exemptions across the board. Thank you. 
Discussion to the Finke Amendment. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Finke, for your work on this uh, on this amendment. And specifically, it does bring uh, this provision in line with uh, controlling U.S. Supreme Court uh, precedent on this issue and make sure that it, that uh, what the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court has said, we have to for, provide for uh, religious institutions or employers who have religious objections that there is a mechanism to do that. So this is a, uh, this is a, a step in the right direction, and I urge members to support it. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> the list moves to amend Senate file number 4097, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A24-0293. To the member from Beltrami, Representative Bliss. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I actually have another amendment that uh, works as a DE, so can we drop, can we introduce that as well? Yes, Representative Bliss, there's an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. Bliss moves to amend the Bliss Amendment to Senate File Number 4097, the second Grossman as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A240298. Representative Bliss. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the amendment to the amendment actually, uh, uh, the first, the first go round on the bill and after speaking with the chair in the industry, uh, it opened up a lot of problems. So we, we worked with the chair, alcohol gambling and enforcement, the industry, and uh, the revisor's office, and I think we came up with uh, something that'll work, and basically this allows for smaller resorts that don't have the wherewithal to buy a full liquor license, which can be $1,600 or more for just the permit, uh, to, to allow them to sell beer to the fishermen that come into their resort. So that's, that's my amendment, thank you. Representative Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Bliss, for uh, working on uh, this amendment and providing uh, this uh, secondary amendment. I urge a yes vote on this secondary amendment. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment to the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails, and the amendment to the amendment is adopted. Back to the underlying amendment, Representative Bliss. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And now that the secondary amendment is on, I would encourage members to vote yes on the underlying amendment. And again, thank you to Representative Bliss. Any discussion, further discussion on the amended Bliss Amendment? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment as amended say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment as amended is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. New Brindley moves to amend Senate file number 4097, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A1. To the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, in the underlying bill, um, no, we are choosing okay. to opt out of uh, some banking provisions at the federal level. It's this Didmica. I understand that most of your eyes are glazing over as I speak. Um, however, this actually is a big deal. Um, and, and while we are opting out, there are some real concerns for, um, for consumers. Now, interestingly, a little history lesson. When the feds first did this, um, seven states opted out. Folks were concerned about the ramifications of this. However, all but one of those states has opted back in at this point because it actually caused more problems to opt out and there were unintended consequences. So the reality of this, you know, I mean, I will say on its face, opting out of Didmica, uh, on its face, the purpose is to sort of protect consumers, right, from high interest loans. That's the goal of opting out. And, I, and certainly I trust that that is the actual goal of opting out. Um, however, there's a lot of things that this uh, opt-out doesn't consider. 
Most importantly, I would suggest is the idea that, well, not the idea, the fact that credit cards are exempted from this opt-out. Which means that in Minnesota, folks have credit cards with interest rates as high as 30, 35 percent. It's, we would all agree that's not good. Um, and by removing, by opting out of Didmica, what we are doing is we are not allowing consumers to take out, frankly, high interest rate loans. That's, that's really what this is about. The problem, once again, is that we're not offering them any other solutions. All we are doing is taking away an option that can be helpful for folks. We are taking away an option for folks to say, and let's be clear, the folks who are taking advantage of these loans don't qualify for a, a 4% or a 6% or an 8% interest rate loan. They just don't qualify. They're not getting it. That's off the table for these folks. But the option we're taking away from them is to say, well, I've got these really extraordinarily high interest rate credit cards, and now I don't get to trade those for a 20% interest rate loan by somebody who is willing to do that. We are taking a tool out of the toolbox and we are not giving any other solution for these folks, none. We are not creating a program to provide additional services. We are not uh, creating a program for loan forgiveness, thank heavens. We are not creating classes for money management. We're not teaching people how to deal with debt. We are doing none of those things with this legislation. The only thing we are doing is taking away an option that folks currently have. Now, I suspect that those of us in this chamber, I can't imagine that any of us would take out a, a high interest rate loan as a first choice. We wouldn't. But I suspect that the vast majority of us in this chamber would also qualify for reasonable interest rate loans in the sense that any of them are reasonable at this point. And so it's a real... <laughs> I've got this term stuck in my head, but it's a real luxury belief for us to say, well, we're not going to do that. We don't have to make that choice. But we're going to take that choice away from other people who might need to. Who other people who might need to. And of course, Minnesota, we don't exist in a vacuum here. We don't get to make laws in Minnesota that prevent people from making other choices. We're, we're, not, we're not taking away the choice of folks in Minnesota to take out other high-risk loans. We're not taking away the choice of people to go to Hudson or St. Croix Falls or Superior or Fargo across our borders and take out really risky title loans. We're not solving a problem. All we are doing is taking away one tool in the toolbox that right now folks who are frankly not in a good place, if you are taking out a high interest loan, you are not in a good place. And by opting out of Didmica, we're not solving that problem for you. All we are doing is saying, you don't get this choice. That's all we're doing. And so I would ask members, as you consider this, you will think about those folks who don't have another choice right now. And ask yourself, do you want to take cho away choices without actually helping, 
without actually solving their problems because you are not. With this underlying bill, you are not solving a problem for someone. You are only taking away potential solutions. And I would ask for a green vote on the amendment. Discussion to the proposed amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Katizo Toon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, lawmakers in 1980 couldn't have imagined today's online lending marketplace where a consumer in their living room in Minnesota can take out a high interest loan originating from a state chartered bank in Utah in a matter of minutes. To be clear, opting out of DIDMCA or the Federal Depository Institutions Deregulation and Monetary Control Act of 1980 prevents only predatory high interest credit that is proven to be harmful to the vast majority of borrowers. Minnesotans will continue to enjoy access to debt management plans through nonprofits and debt consolidation and other loan products through 114 regulated lenders currently licensed in the state of Minnesota. Like payday loans that were regulated last session, these loans trap consumers in interest and fees that cannot be repaid and lead to a debt trap that takes a borrower's financial situation from bad to worse. We've heard a lot of talk about how this provision will prohibit loans that are necessary for people who don't otherwise have access to credit. But both the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the U.S. Department of Defense have completed studies in 2021 and confirmed that many such borrowers have access to credit cards that offer much lower interest rates and that service members protected by the Military Lending Act's rate caps continue to have access to compliance credit products that meet their needs. In certain cases where borrowers face short-term financial emergencies, Minnesotans can access emergency assistance and other cash grant programs. This provision is supported by the Minnesota Credit Union Network, the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition, Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota, Legal Aid, and others. When DIDMCA was enacted, these shady rent-a-bank schemes did not exist. While out-of-state banks can continue to operate here in Minnesota, Minnesotans should have the expectation that they are protected and that these banks are ob ob obeying by our state laws. They should have to follow the same regulations that the hundreds of Minnesota banks, credit unions, regulated lenders, and other financial institutions have to follow. Minnesotans will continue to enjoy access to responsible and credit building credit, but would no longer be subject to predatory lending by out of state companies who are exploiting a loophole and exploiting Minnesotans. I would ask for a no vote. Further discussion on the A1 amendment. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, just to address a couple of things, you know, here's the problem. Once again, uh, folks will not be subject to out-of-state predatory lending anymore. Of course they will. We don't live in a vacuum. We don't live in a vacuum. And we have four border states. And if you represent communities like mine, it's really easy to get to those states. I live a lot closer to Wisconsin than I do to St. Paul. You are not solving a problem. You are exclusively taking away options when people are struggling. And you want to say these folks have access to debt management and all these other services, and yet their problems are not being solved. You're not helping them access those things with this bill. You are not helping them access any of those supports with this bill. You are exclusively taking away options that folks currently have when they need help. Madam Speaker, I would request a roll call. 
Representative New Brindley requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. And I would request a, a green vote on the bill. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll in the amendment. Will the chief clerk please call the name of the member who's voting remotely? Keeler. Keeler votes no. Keeler votes no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> New Brindley moves to amend Senate file number 4097, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A2. The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, so in current statute, a municipality is uh, They've got the right to own and operate a telephone exchange, which is almost kind of funny language at this point, right? A telephone exchange. But basically, these are, are companies and often small local companies that provide services like, frankly, old school telephone services, and now more importantly, broadband, uh, high speed internet access, this kind of thing. Those are the kinds of companies we're talking about, just so that we all make sure we're on the same page. Um, and right now, Municipalities are allowed to own and operate these companies, these telephone exchanges. And in fact, they even have the right in current statute to acquire an existing plant by condemnation. They can literally take it. They can take one of these companies that might be private, privately owned. However, currently in statute, you at least have to take that decision to the public. You at least have to go and get a vote of the public if you want to steal a private company from its owners. That's the current lay of the land. However, for some reason, there is language in the underlying bill to remove the requirement to take this to a vote. So now, what Democrats are saying is we're going to allow a city council, a local municipality, to literally take a private company to acquire an existing plant by condemnation with a majority vote of a city council. Meaning... <laughs> If you have three members of a city council out of five who think it's a good idea to take this telecommunications exchange by condemnation, it is done. Three people in a municipality can choose to take a telecommunications company. This is no small thing. This is no small thing. This is wild. Now, what we were told in committee is that, is that well, but there's accountability because these folks can just be voted out. These are elected officials, so they can be voted out. Well, guess what? When three people have chosen to acquire an existing plant by condemnation, when three people choose to steal a company for the municipality, I assure you that that process is not undone with a new election. This has real consequences. And the least we should do 
is maintain the current language that requires a vote. Let's let the people of a community have input on such significant decisions. And I want to be real clear. The companies we are talking about, we're talking about real companies that probably many of us pay a utility bill to. Companies like Benton Communications or CTC or Paul Bunyan, Nevera and New Ulm, or 702 Communication up in Moorhead. These are real companies that this legislation is saying three people on a city council can choose to steal that company for the municipality. I hope you can all see what a no-brainer this amendment is to at least require, to continue to require a vote of the citizens of that municipality before three people are allowed to make such a consequential decision for the citizens of that municipality and for those companies. I would request a green vote and a roll call, Madam Representative Speaker. Representative New Brindley requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands or thereabouts, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Madam Discussion Speaker. to the amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so I'm going to recommend a no vote on this. Um, this section of the bill is giving municipalities more flexibility in meeting the telecom and broadband needs of their res residents. Now, I will say there needs to be some additional guardrails put on this language that we have proposed to the telecom folks about a month ago and have yet to get a response. I think they may have been more focused on a different bill. Um, but at, when that does get, the intention would be to include that in conference. I will point out that with city council, um, majority votes of a city council can do many things today, including hiring and firing a city manager, uh, eminent domain, setting the budget and tax levy, filling a council vacancy, uh, setting franchise fees, housing and redevelopment, tax abatement, TIF, and many other things. Um, so I, I think that this is in response to needs, especially in some greater Minnesota locations where needs aren't being met. And I think with the proper guardrails around this, um, I think it's a, it's a good amendment. I'd like to keep it in, and so I'd recommend a no vote. The member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm wondering if Representative Kraft could yield a few questions, please. He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Kraft, the first question that I want to ask you about the, um, the, the provision in this um, amendment is from 65 people, excuse me, 65 percent of people served in a community on this. So if we used to use round numbers on here, a small community of 1,000 people that means 650 people would have to be um, approving of the decertification and condemnation of their local phone company. The bill contemplates, as Representative New pointed out, and we've discussed in committee, a simple majority of the city council. In many cities, there are cities of the, of the uh, fourth and fifth class, which means that they have four, excuse me, five members on their city council. Uh, Representative Kraft, the question is, um, what's, the what's the notification for the public to come and to testify on this? Is there a requirement for a public hearing, or is the council going to just be able to take action without receiving any formal input from the community? Representative Kraft. Madam Speaker, I don't believe the uh, bill language discusses public hearings. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Kraft. You were mentioning before that you believe this bill needs some more guardrails around there. I would make that my number one guardrail that the public somehow has input, whether they're not going to be allowed to vote on this anymore um, based on the changes in the, the bill and our amendment putting the people's rights back in here. Um, that would seem to me to be something that would be rather important. Simply, this might be done on what's known as a consent agenda, an item that the City Council generally believes isn't controversial, at least in their eyes, and by one full vote, including minutes and other uh, miscellaneous things, the phone company could be taken away. Representative Kraft, would you yield to another question, please, Madam Speaker? He will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Kraft, my second question is, if a community 
uh, multiple communities are serviced by the same phone company. And one of the city councils, let's use the one that I was using in my example here, with a thousand people in the community. How does your bill anticipate the unraveling of that phone company and the sale of certain assets to, um, to the city to be able to have that telecom service and still fully support the remaining four or five or six or ten or however other many communities may still be a part of that telephone company? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Kraft. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative O'Driscoll. Also, back to your previous question, I want to point out, having been on city council for several years, every city council meeting, there is a agenda that's posted in advance that the public sees and may comment, and may comment on and come in on. So there's, there's opportunities for public hearings. On your question, um, there really is, uh, today, in the language that's in there, that the exact same thing could happen. Representative O'Driscoll. Madam Speaker, I don't believe I got an answer to the second question, but I will also let you know that I've also served on city council and been a mayor as well. So we do share something in common that Representative Kraft uh, in, the, in the processes on that. The question that I asked that I have not gotten an answer to is if there's a community that's being serviced by a telephone company that's servicing multiple communities and a community by majority vote of the city council wants to decertify, condemn and take that or steal that phone company, how are the other communities going to be able to survive? And how, is the pro how does this bill anticipate the uncoupling of the phone service so that the one community who has 1,000 people can start and have their own phone service without affecting the remaining communities? He will yield. Representative Kraft. Madam Chair, Representative O'Driscoll. So uh, the bill language doesn't contemplate that in specific. However, what I'll point out is the, the, uh, the existing language could have the exact same situation. So there were different criteria for, uh, for a municipality to be able to assume control of a, uh, of a um, telecom provider in their community, but the same situation you're talking about could have happened then too. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. But um, Representative Kraft, at least there would have been a public notification of this because you'd have a 65% um, requirement of people to vote to decertify. So I'm assuming that there would be something on the ballot that people would say, gee, our phone company is going to be decertified. Here again, a simple majority of the city council at, an, at a council meeting on a posted agenda item, this could end up being taken away. And when you say that it's not anticipated in here, the threshold at 65% is up here, and the likelihood of that happening is very minimal compared to a simple three to two majority vote of a city council. Members, there are two reasons right there, very straightforward, very simple. Reasons why the New Brindley Amendment should have a green vote. And again, Madam Chair, or Madam Speaker, I would like to underscore this is going to be a green vote, and I appreciate Representative New Brindley asking for a roll call on here because your phone company may be in jeopardy and you don't even know it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I also have some question, or a, at least a question for Representative Kraft if he would yield. He will yield. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Kraft. Uh, has there, have I missed something in the news? Is that, have, have we had challenges where we've had runaway telecom companies that are somehow, you know, not serving constituents and thus the city council must act immediately to change course in Minnesota? Representative Kraft. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Schultz, uh, I don't know that I'm aware of runaway, however you phrased it, but I think there are concerns with how folks in certain communities are being served. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Kraft. I certainly understand your right and ability to, to bring forward some concerns that you may have heard in your own community. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, maybe, maybe that's something that should be taken to the voters. But, you know, Right now, we have a, an amendment or a, some underlying language, I should say, in this, this, this bill that frankly is undemocratic. It's stripping away the, the chance for, for people to vote on an issue like this that uh, frankly, you know, I don't know that we have a lot of examples where government has run telecom businesses better than the private sector. Uh, would Representative Kraft yield to another question? He will yield. Representative Schultz. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Kraft, are there examples uh, where uh, government and municipalities in particular have better served um, residents with telecom than the private sector? Representative Kraft. Madam Speaker, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to speculate on served better public versus, uh, versus private. I'm sure there are situations of both. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, Representative Kraft. I, I just hope that we're not changing state policy on this and putting the decision-making in the hands of uh, three people um, that are a part of a city council um, just because in a given community across the state, citizens have had concerns, but they haven't been able to convince the rest of the residents in their community that they should take an action like taking over a private business, taking over a telecom business. And, you know, frankly, I'm unaware, though I'm not saying that it hasn't happened, but I'm unaware of an instance where we're literally handing more authority to a government to take over a private business in this state. And I'm really concerned about the precedent that this is going to, 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 to set in our state. You know, right now there are businesses being set up along the lines of uh, producing cannabis and producing marijuana and, and you know, local munis municipalities will have to deal with licensing of those facilities. Are, are we going to go down the route of having private enterprise set up businesses, set up successful systems, work to provide services in communities only to have the government strip them away? I mean, this, frankly, this underlying language is bonkers. Like, what are we doing? It's completely undemocratic to take away the rights of the people in favor of three-fifths of a city council over something that the private sector can definitely do better than government. Like, I'm really not for growing government at any level, and now we want them to deliver telecom to, to the residents of this state and, 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 and do it through a city council rather than a vote of the people? You know, I know we live in a constitutional republic, but this is undemocratic. And so we need to adopt the New Brindley Amendment. The member from Wasika, Representative Petersburg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and would Representative Kraft at, uh, yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Petersburg. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and Representative Brand, I, I worked with you on some other bills before, and I, I know that you're one that works real hard to get consensus and, and build to, to really move forward. But the question I ask, for, ask of you is, I think I heard you say that you do agree that there needs to be some more guardrails on this particular proposal and that you hope that you're going to get something for conference committee uh, to be able to put into this bill. Is, is that what I heard you say? Representative Kraft. Madam Chair, yes, um, Representative, Peter, yes, Representative Petersburg. Uh, actually, there is a proposal out to the telecom folks um, on some of these guardrails that we've been waiting for feedback for a month on. Um, and we're told that we should get it momentarily. And uh, at that point, yeah, my intention would be to have that go into conference committee. Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and to me, that's a couple of problem, problematic areas there. First of all, is that what if we don't get that answer? And sometimes that happens here. We just don't get the answer we, we've got. Then it would be better for us to take this guardrails uh, that is done with New Brindley's uh, amendment here. And even if we do get that, you could still add that onto the conference committee and correct it to the way, way you want to. The problem is, is that too often here we're hearing, well, we know there's some issues here. We'll deal with it at the conference. Here's what I have a problem with, is that that means that either three or five people from this body will make all the decisions we won't have any opportunity to amend or debate or anything until it comes back as a conference report, and then it's either an up or down. And that means that those three or five people are going to be making these decisions without us being involved with it. We've actually heard that process really too many times here 
We should be doing our work before it comes to the floor and making sure that the bill is actually ready for passage. And, and to me, that's the, the problem here. Uh, and, and I do know that, Representative Kraft, you, you're working hard, uh, and, but again, it's one of those things where we're not quite finished, and yet we're going to be asked to vote on it. So please um, reconsider New Brindley's amendment and accept that, and then if you need to fix it in the conference committee, fix it there. But at least we would have this correction done now rather than having to worry about what comes back from the conference committee. Uh, thank you. Further discussion to the A2 amendment. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the discussion. Um, we've heard some interesting things during the discussion. Um, one, we heard that since city councils have the right to run their cities, like levying taxes, hiring a city manager, uh, filling a city council seat, since they have the right to run a city, they should also have the right to steal a company. That is odd logic, really odd logic. Um, we also heard that there are concerns with how people are being served. Um, and I know that's true, I know that's true. We also know that literally billions of dollars have put into, been put into broadband in just the last few years. And it takes time for those dollars to work their way out and actually improve broadband access. That takes time. And I can just imagine three bozos on a city council who think, no, the answer here is we're going to take over. I am sure that we can do this right. I am sure that we can take over and do this right. I mean, come on. Interestingly, the, other, the underlying language doesn't, or excuse me, the underlying statute doesn't just require a municipal vote. It requires a 65% threshold. Because when this statute was crafted, no pun intended, when this statute was crafted, they understood that there's some danger in this. They understood that we need a significantly higher threshold than we do for the majority of votes of a city council. And we have also all seen situations, frankly, we see situations here in the legislature where folks come and they're gonna save the world and those rotten folks in the legislature, where I'm gonna get elected and I'm gonna show them, I'm gonna fix everything. And then they get here and they face reality. And they realize that, okay, it's not actually always as easy as we think it's going to be. And so while yes, there are concerns sometimes with how people are being served, I'm gonna quote Reagan. The nine most terrifying words in the English language, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, that applies here. Because the, the, the bill language allows for literally three people on a city council to make this kind of a consequential decision. We are not talking about replacing a city council person, filling a vacant seat. We're not talking about hiring a city manager. We are talking about taking over a company and that should remain with the high threshold of 65% of a municipality looking at that issue and deciding that it is the right thing to do. This language has got to come out of this Commerce Bill. Please vote for yes on the amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Kraft. Madam Chair, um, Representative Brindley, I just have to say a couple things. So we've said, I've heard call this undemocratic. Um, these are city councils, these are elected officials. Three bozos on city council, I have far higher regard for our city governments. There are 340 municipal broadband providers in the United States and many in Minnesota. Municipal governments also control water utilities, electric utilities, sewer, many other utilities. 
this is uh, what we're doing here is to give them the ability uh, in in certain situations, in critical situations, to provide for their constituents. So again, I ask a vote of no. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Will the Chief Clerk please call the name of the member who is voting remotely? Keeler. Keeler votes no. Keeler votes no. The Clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. New Brindley moves to amend Senate file number 4097, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A14. The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. We are changing gears abruptly. Um, in, in the underlying bill, um, there is language there's, there's an insurance mandate. There's an insurance mandate to provide um, gender-affirming care that insurance companies are required to pay for that care. This amendment simply says that we are removing the medical procedures from that mandate. It would still require counseling and referral services, telehealth, et cetera, um, but it would remove the medical gender reassignment portion of this. And I want to say there are, there are reasons for this. Um, I, won't, I won't belabor the point, but there are long-term permanent consequences of these decisions. And this body has acknowledged that kids do not have the brain development to deal with things like smoking or smoking pot or drinking alcohol or any number of things. And so certainly it should be our job as adults to make sure we are protecting them when we're talking about very real permanent changes. Things like there are obvious permanent irreversible changes from surgeries. That one's easy. But there are also irreversible changes from hormone therapies, from puberty blockers, from cross-sex hormones. There are permanent irreversible changes from these hormones. Things like a decrease in their bone density. Things like an increased risk of breast cancer. Things like infertility, the inability to have children or even the inability to have an orgasm. Things like voice changes and hair loss, irreversible. These are very serious consequences that we as responsible adults, that we as lawmakers, have an obligation when it comes to our kids. We have an obligation when it comes to our kids to make sure that we are protecting them from these long-term, permanent, 
irreversible changes. And making sure that they are at least adults when they make these decisions for themselves. Members, I would ask for a yes vote. There's an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. Franzen moves to amend the New Brindley Amendment to Senate File Number 4097, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A23. The member from Douglas, Representative Franzen. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. So the amendment to the amendment requires health plans that provide cover for gender affirming care to provide cover for any consequences related to the care, testing, screening necessary to monitor the health of the patient, and reversal of the procedure. On March 6th, I watched the Commerce Committee when the uh, Representative Finke Bill came over, um, was in that committee to mandate insurance coverage. And Representative Schultz offered an amendment for detransitioning care. And here's some of the quotes from that committee. Of those 90,000, 3% identified that were, there was a study that was done, 90,000 people, in that survey, 95% of the people surveyed reported that their lives, they were more satisfied with their lives after gender affirming care and transition. Of those 90,000, 3% identified that were less satisfied. All health care has regret rates. And if you talk to anyone in the health industry, they will tell you that a 3% regret rate just doesn't exist. It's as low as you can ever get. Uh, the quote then says, there are people in the category that Representative Schultz is talking about. Some of them, some people refer to them as detransitioners, people who transition and then retransition. Those, people, those people's gender journey is well respected within the trans community and their medically necessary health care is already covered. That is gender affirming care and it is covered under the current law. So that this amendment is simply unnecessary. We already include them in our community and take care of their health care needs. So I watched that and I was questioning, well, why are other states passing legislation to cover detransitioning? Why are those individuals who consider themselves detransitioners, not able to get the care that they are looking for? Why are they going to legislatures and asking them to change the law and to include detransitioning? So I contacted a healthcare lobbyist from Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I, I said, hey, you know, there's this amendment and I, or this bill, and I sent the bill, and I said, would detransitioners be covered under this bill? And the healthcare lobbyist thought that it would be. So I pushed the healthcare lobbyist some more. And I said, well, if there are no billing codes for the detransitioning, how are the healthcare professionals getting paid? Who pays for that? How is it tracked? About a week later, that same lobbyist came back into my office and he said, you're right. It's not covered. So I contacted a, a medical professional that I know and I said, hey, here's the situation. Are there billing codes for detransitioners? And the medical professional told me there are not medical codes. So without medical codes, there's no way for individuals to get reimbursed for the detransitioning. Without medical codes, there's no way to track who actually is detransitioning. So some people will say, well, there's hardly any regret. There's hardly anybody that's detransitioning back. It just simply doesn't happen. But people say that because there's no billing codes to track what is happening. And 
The World Health Organization, under um, one of their frequently asked questions about um, international classification, it says the uh, international classification serves to record and report health and health-related conditions globally. ICD ensures um, interoperability of digital health data and their comparability. The ICD contains diseases, disorders, health conditions, and much more. The inclusion of a specific category into ICD depends on utility to the different uses of ICD and sufficient evidence that a health condition exists. That's how we know that there's certain cancers on the rise based on those ICD codes. That's how we know about heart attacks. Um, any number of health conditions are traced by these billing codes. Um, in an article uh, called, uh, from the Daily Caller, some of you might not like that, but um, here's how the medical industry is keeping detransitioners from getting crucial care. Um, reads, furthermore, data collection about the healthcare needs of detransitioners is se severely impaired because there are no diagnostic or procedural medical billing codes to describe them or their care. So if there are no billing codes, these people do not exist. A recent JAMA study used ICD codes to illustrate a sharp increase in sex reassignment surgery between 2016 to 2019. The researchers identified the data by locating ICD codes for gender identity disorders. However, one could not replicate a similar search for detransitioners because there are no ICD codes to describe their care. While there are medical billing codes for history of sex reassignment surgery and transsexualism, there are no codes for detransitioners and physicians treating detransitioners are forced to record medical encounters under billing codes for other diagnoses. Dr. Carrie Mendoza, the Director of Fair and Medicine, told the DCNF that until the needed billing codes are created, researchers lack a reliable way to collect data on the growing cohort of detransitioners. Mendoza says, without proper documentation for the growing cohort of new patients, the healthcare system cannot properly document their medical issues accurately bill for services or conduct proper research into the best practices for all suffering from gender dysphoria. Members, this is not a, this should not be a partisan issue. This is human lives that deserve the dignity and the respect to have their health care just the way they received it when they decided to transition. And if those same individuals that use the medical complex to, or to transition and to take the hormones and surgery or, or what, what have you, however far they went, that same medical community needs to be there if that individual decided that what they did was a mistake, that they want to go back to where they started from. So I, I'm asking that uh, the amendment be accepted. Um, and I, I really do not want to hear that this detransitioners would be covered under any bill because they are not. And if a provider were to code a detransitioner under another type of code, that's going to be, that's going to be um, insurance fraud because it, you just can't code something that's wrong in order to get paid. So members, I'm pleading with you to vote yes on this amendment and to treat everyone with dignity. Thank you. Discussion on the amendment to the amendment. The member from Ramsey, Representative Finke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, members, I recommend a no vote on the amendment to the amendment. Um, Representative Franzen, I thank you for um, summarizing the argument that I made in committee. I will make the same argument here. Trans people are overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly bettered by gender affirming care. It is health care. When we have access to it, our lives improve. 95% of the largest survey of 98,000 trans people found 
that we are more satisfied with our lives when we have access to health care. To the argument um, that we just heard, this is actually a new argument that I have not heard before. Um, up until yesterday, there were so many detransitioners and we were ignoring them. Now there are so few detransitioners that they're getting lost in the medical codes. Um, the data is clear. There are some people who detransition. It is very few. Just last week, we saw this report from England. Many people are probably familiar with it on the other side of the aisle. It studied hormones and puberty blockers, and it found very complicated results. But one of the things it did not find was detransitioners. Statistically insignificant between 0 and 10 people in that longitudinal study of trans people and their health care, 0 to 10 people detransitioned. We don't even know because they don't even put the number in. They just put an X in the page because it doesn't matter. It's too few to even matter in the study. Detransitioners are real. Their health care is covered. We don't cover people's transition or detransition. We code treatment. We are treating gender dysphoria. If you are detransition, you are being treated for gender dysphoria. We do not need to pretend like this is not already real. Minnesota is leading the way, in fact, and we are the reason the ACA must cover gender-affirming care. We're just closing some gaps. Please vote no against this amendment to the amendment and protect gender-affirming care for everyone. Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment. The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I first of all, I would request a roll call on this amendment to the amendment. Representative New Brindley requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Um, I, just, I just want to address something really quickly. Um, clearly, we've all acknowledged, it's been acknowledged on both sides, that detransitioning is real. And then it does happen. And while it may be too few to be acknowledged in the study, it is not too few to be acknowledged by me. It is not too few to matter to their families. It is not too few for us to care about and ensure that they are being counted. Because this line of thinking that somehow the number is insignificant, so they shouldn't be counted, that is the data that Representative Franson just gave us. This is about saying, this is very technical, let's, let's think this through. They are literally saying that because the billing codes don't exist, the data doesn't exist. But the people do exist. So let's make sure this is so easy. Why in the world would we not say that there needs to be a billing code? The only reason to vote no on this is because of blind ideology. It has nothing to do with logic or sense on this one. This one is easy. Members, vote yes. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you, Representative Franson and Representative New Brindley. And uh, Representative Finke, I want to say that, like, I appreciate tonight that you mentioned that you learned something new in the last 24 hours or so as the amendment has been brought forward. And I'm glad that that brings us to a place where we can vote and from an informed perspective tonight to understand that there are people who aren't being served. And that's why it's important to adopt Representative uh, Franson's amendment to the amendment and why we shouldn't be fearful of that. We should not be fearful about what this would do and the protections that it would provide for others, for people. And we see them. We see them. And if we're going to see them in this body, then we need to vote for this amendment. Thank you. Seeing no further Discussion, the member from uh, Douglas, Representative Franson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, you know, um, England just shut down their clinic for children. 
that did gender affirming care. Um, shut that down. Um, the Mayo Clinic, the Mayo Clinic came out with a study. New Mayo Clinic study finds mild to severe atrophy in testes of boys on puberty blockers, along with cancer. And I would applaud, uh, implore you all to read the, the study from the Mayo Clinic. Um, this is the same Mayo Clinic that told us that we should be wearing masks. And everybody said the Mayo Clinic told us to wear masks. We got to follow the science. Well, now the Mayo Clinic is saying some, some health concerns on hormone therapy for children. Maybe we should listen to that too. Uh, April 4th, this uh, Representative Finke's bill was heard in the Health Finance and Policy Committee where Representative Nadeau had offered an amendment. And uh, Representative Finke's testimony went like this. I am going to ask members to vote against this amendment, and it's not because I don't appreciate the concern that's being brought. Detransition is a real thing. Gender affirming care covers transition. Um, goes, she goes on to say, he goes on to, she goes on to say, I am not prone to add comfort language. I had carried a bill last year to remove some comfort language from 1993 at a great personal cost, so I would like to avoid that. The bill covers what we are doing, and I think that's good. Um, this, this amendment before you is not comfort language. This is real. Representative Finke, you have acknowledged detransitioners are real. Well, if they are real, which we know they are real, then we should treat them the same way that we are treating those who are transitioning. The medical industry needs to be there for them. This is, this, we're talking about human lives here real human lives that deserve dignity and respect as well. Just because they have decided to change their mind does not mean that we can't be there for them. And that's why by passing a bill such as this, an amendment such as this, it sends a signal, it sends a signal that we need to create insurance codes. This bill itself doesn't create an insurance code. It sends the message that insurance codes are needed, billing codes are needed so that the individuals can get the care that they deserve and we can also track. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, yes, roll call if you have forgotten. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment to the amendment. Will the clerk please call the name of the member who is voting <clears throat> remotely? Keeler. Keeler votes no. Keeler votes no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 62 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment to the amendment is not adopted. To the underlying amendment, the member from Ramsey, Representative Finke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And back to the original amendment, which seeks to ban the access to gender-affirming care for people under 21. Um, I would request members vote no on this bill. Um, gender-affirming care is health care. If gender-affirming care is health care, then it it is not up to us to determine at what age someone should have access to their health care. We do not do this for other forms of health care. We say families and doctors make decisions that are best for the people that they love, and we leave them to it. What we don't do is say, you can have certain kinds of health care when you reach not adulthood, but, but age 21, um, but only some kinds of health care and other kinds of health care you can access, but this kind you can't, right? We are in charge of our own lives. Our families are in charge of who we are. We make decisions together and we move forward. 
Gender-affirming care in Minnesota is not provided without parental consent. Gender-affirming care in Minnesota does not provide surgery to people under 18. Gender-affirming care is health care, and these are decisions that are best made by our families. And just because we are quoting me at length from the Health Committee, I want to refer back to the Health Committee where I said that I decided not to quote the Republican governor of Ohio, Mike DeWine, when he vetoed that state's ban on gender-affirming care for minors. Um, but I decided tonight that I would read from his veto letter. Again, this is Mike DeWine, the Republican governor of Ohio, when he had a ban on gender-affirming care for minors at his desk. He said, quote, these tough decisions should not be made by the government. They should be made by the people who love these kids most, and that is parents. Parents who have raised their children, the parents who have seen their children go through agony, the parents who worry about that child every single day of their life. That's who should be making these decisions. Not the government, not us, not anyone else, families and their doctors. Vote no. Discussion. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and luckily, this amendment is not about banning gender-affirming care. Um, you know, Minnesota, Minnesota has a long history of protecting children, and that's what, that's what this amendment tries to do. Um, we, don't let them, we don't let children smoke before they're 21. We don't let them drive before they're 16. They need to be 18 before they can get a tattoo. And even this underlying bill includes a provision that prohibits anyone from under 21 years of, old, years, years of age from purchasing aerosol dusters. This is what we do. We protect kids. And let's not even talk about the flavor ban. You know, Minnesota used to have this strong history of reviewing and evaluating medical treatments, policies, and finding that balance that provided reasonable access and a standard of care with appropriate guardrails. Gender-affirming care is an affirming model. This is, this is different. It's an affirming model of trans health care that's based on a declaration from someone that they're transgender. It's argued that psychotherapy may or may not be necessary because kids, in this case, know who they are, and that's the affirming protocol. The under, this underlying bill has, has, has few guardrails, and it has zero restrictions. And this amendment merely reserves the medical and surgical components to adults, to people over 21 years of, old, years of age. The fewer safeguards that we, that we put in place, the less we talk to kids about their feelings, their motives, the higher rates of regret are out there. May 10th, 2022, it was the first detransitioner lawsuit that was filed. They've continued to grow, almost all alleging a breach of the standard of care. Children's Hospital in Colorado no longer provides gender-affirming care. Washington University in St. Louis. I'm not arguing against gender-affirming gender care. I think, it's, I, think, I think it's important. The amendment that Representative New Brindley is bringing is basically protecting children, making sure that, that they're able to make those decisions. A course, the full course of, of medical transition, even if it's just hormonal, will affect children and adolescents for the rest of their lives. This, this amendment provides those safeguards because this new affirming model of care provides no second guessing of a child's stated identity. If children knew what they wanted to be at, at age six or eight or 10, 
We'd have a world that's full of doctors and presidents and race car drivers and cowboys. And that's, that's not health, that, that is not a standard of care. So without reasonable guardrails, Minnesota will truly be the outlier in this area of medicine. So I recommend that we vote green on this. We protect Minnesota's children. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Olmsted, Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I don't know, well, actually, I do know that when the Ohio governor vetoed, he didn't have the information and knowledge from the Mayo study, which indicated lifelong and possible major health concerns for um, some of the treatments. I'm not sure if he knew about the study, the longitudinal, 15-year longitudinal study in the Netherlands with thousands of children, their age 11 through the mid-20s. And the vast majority that had during the early years uh, gender dysphoria, gender confusion, didn't when they reached the 20s. Some, some did. I, I, the difference between the two sides of the argument is I hear a lot of just saying gender-affirming care from one side. From the other side, and from the amendment, I hear adolescent and children. Um, you know, frankly, most of Europe was ahead of us. And they seem to be ahead of us now with multiple nations. Now that they've got many years of information deciding that there are issues and risks of making permanent changes before adolescence and, and adulthood. And I hear a lot of, well, the vast majority of people that transition don't detransition. Well, all of the studies that I'm hearing that from are dominated by the fact that the vast majority of transitions happen after they're already through adolescence because many years you've been able to receive that. It hasn't been quite as long for children. I hear parents' rights. I didn't hear parents' rights when we said, a, you know, talked against taking away the parents' rights if they decided it wasn't time or right or they wanted a different treatment than gender transitioning for a prepubescent, uh, adolescent, young children. Because a lot of parents realize that kids develop and they try different things and they look, um, but oftentimes they go through many transitions in their life. When I was in college, I noticed a lot of people that experimented and tried different things and they made major life decisions, but they were adults. We don't have time to go through every single thing that children are not allowed to do by their own choice that's restricted because our society and many societies protect children. The adults protect children. And this amendment is meant to protect children and not make a permanent change before they're adults. You, when they were bringing up examples of facilities that stopped doing transition care, 
children's hospitals, and et cetera. The commonality is children. So, you know, if, if we can't allow them so many different things, but it's fine to make a permanent change before they're adults. And the people listening, I don't understand why we don't have a common logic when it comes to protecting children. But I'm going to vote green. I wish that it passed. But hey, I put the lifelong um, best welfare of the children, you know, above a life-changing thing done, you know, even before their adolescence, before they're in puberty. So, vote green. The member from Ramsey, Representative Curran. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'm wondering if Representative Finke might yield for a question. She will yield. Representative Curran. Thank you. Uh, Representative Finke, um, could you remind us uh, when a child might be seeking gender affirming care, who makes that decision? Representative Finke. Thank you, Representative Curran. Yes, uh, gender affirming care for minors has been available for decades, and it is um, parents' decisions uh, whether or not to pr pursue gender affirming care. Representative Curran. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Representative Finke. Um, I think it's it's clear here that you know we we are saying that parents are responsible to make decisions for their own children, and of course we all know that a parent's number one priority is to protect their children. And part of protecting children who are going through um, you know who might need uh, gender affirming care or having a situation that involves gender identity. Um, we know that those kids have higher rates of suicidality. Um, we know that kids experience higher rates of depression. And lack of care, lack of ability uh, to become who they are, uh, only uh, increases uh, the likelihood um, that kids may not live to see adulthood. And so uh, for that very reason, um, I would say that I, I encourage a no vote on this amendment um, because uh, limiting, limiting the care that kids need, specifically when it comes to gender affirming care, only increases the chances that, that they will not reach adulthood. The member from Douglas, Representative Franzen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have to address uh, about the, the parents portion of it. Last year we passed a bill out of here that if a child was not getting the support they wanted from their parent, they could leave or be kidnapped from that state and move to Minnesota for gender-affirming uh, gender care. If a child is not getting, quote unquote, affirmed by their parents, they can still get the care done. Parents don't have a say in this at all. I find that really hilarious and a lie. I can't believe we're being gaslit here. As far as the, uh, the suicide and, and that stuff, that's emotional abuse. That's emotional abuse. If you don't do this, if you don't allow your child to do this, your child may end up killing themselves. That's how these medical professionals, it's all about the money, order to trick the parents and the child into lifelong irreversible damage. I used to, be, I used to believe that I was born in the wrong body. And the adults in my life whom I trusted affirmed my belief, and this caused me lifelong irreversible harm. I speak to you today as a victim of one of the biggest medical scandals in the history of the United States of America. I speak to you in the hope that you will have the courage to bring the scandal to an end and ensure that other vulnerable teenagers, children, and young adults don't go through what I went through. That was Chloe Cole at Congress when she spoke last year. Chloe was born July 27, 2004. She began transitioning at the age of 12 and detransitioned at 17 after 
having undergone treatment which included puberty blockers, testosterone, and a double mastectomy. Between 12 and 17 years old. Is healthcare really healthcare if you're having a mastectomy before you're 21 years of age? Is healthcare really healthcare if you're being chemically castrated? Is healthcare really healthcare if you could get cancer? I can tell none of you over there have even read the Mayo study. The authors presented a case of a 12-year-old patient who underwent treatment with puberty blockers for 14 months. In this individual, 59% of the sex glands showed complete atrophy, along with the presence of microphthaliasis, a condition where small clusters of calcium form in, in the testicles. The insights suggest that puberty blockers could lead to lasting structural changes. Additional research has shown a link between testicular microthiolysis, whatever that, and testicular cancer. Is that healthcare? Is that the healthcare you want to put on minors? Do you think minors have the ability to comprehend the fact that they're going to get cancer? That they're being chemically castrated? We're not saying you can't do it, but at least be an adult when you're making those decisions. This body used to protect children. Further discussion to the A14 amendment. Representative New Brindley, are you seeking recognition? Thank you, Madam Speaker. And before we go on, I'd like to request a roll call on this vote, please. Representative New Brindley requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to address a couple of things, and uh, several things have been addressed, and I, and I appreciate that. Um, I would just say I, I'm glad that uh, the letter from Governor DeWine was read and really focused on parents and the requirement of parents. I would remind folks of the language, and, and Representative Franson talked about it, I would remind folks of the language that was passed out of this body just last year. that literally says that if a parent or guardian that, that parents, it literally says parents and guardians actually do not have the authority. In fact, it says the opposite, that if in another state, a child is removed because a parent or guardian did allow gender affirming care, that that must not be enforced in this state. It's the exact opposite of what we were just told. And, and I don't know why there's this effort to say that parents get to choose because they don't. Under the law in Minnesota, they do not get to choose. And frankly, I'll be honest, and I've said this before, I don't necessarily think parents should choose. I've had to do a lot of soul searching the last few years on what I think our highest moral obligation is. And for me, that means it's not always about parents choosing. On the conversion therapy bill last year, for me, that was not about parents choosing. My belief is that that should not be done to children, regardless of what the parents choose. And my belief, and frankly, the belief of the vast majority of Minnesotans, is that adults should not condone medical transition of children, regardless of what the parents say. 
The vast majority of Minnesotans believe, as do I, that it is our job as responsible adults to protect children at all costs. That that is our very highest moral obligation. And while we want to tell parents about the suicidality and depression of their kids, we don't want to tell them that that exists after we do these things to their children. Along with all of the other permanent, irreversible changes we are allowing to happen to kids. Members, you have a choice. And I know that it's not just this side of the aisle that thinks that doing this to kids is a bad idea. But don't you dare go back to your districts and say, I didn't have a choice. I had to do it. Because you do have a choice. You do have a choice. And the decisions we make in this chamber should always, always be to protect children. Every time. Members vote yes on the amendment. The member from Ramsey, Representative Finke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm not going to respond to all of the things that we have heard here tonight about gender affirming care. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to let people know that um, gender affirming care is health care. Gender affirming care is not akin to smoking. It is not akin to getting a tattoo. It is not akin to anything. Being a transgender person doesn't have anything to do with being a kid who wants to grow up to be the president. It doesn't have anything to do with things that you might experiment with in college. It doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you may have um, anxiety or depression as an adult. Uh, being a transgender person is just being a part of the human experience. Trans people have always existed. Trans people will always exist. This is irrefutable, undeniable. Gender affirming care is a part of our healthcare landscape and it has been for decades. We are having conversations for the first time um, as people learn about something they maybe didn't know existed before and have discovered. But I just want to make sure that you know that um, we don't act like we're not real and we don't debate the idea that um, trans people deserve to be loved and receive the health care that their parents um, approve of. This is, you want to make the choice easy, the choice is easy. We are here, we are trans. There is health care that helps us thrive. Um, and people should have access to it. So vote against the amendment, vote for the bill, vote for people to be able to just live. That's all. Thank you. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Will the clerk please call the name of the member who's voting remotely? Keeler. Keeler votes no. Keeler votes no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 62 ayes and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate file number 4097, as amended. Third reading, as amended. Discussion to the bill. I won't always uh, see a nod or a wave, so if you want to be recognized and I haven't seen you, please stand up and even then maybe wave your arms because it's getting late. Uh, the member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. 
Okay. <laughs> the member from Anoka, Representative Niska. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. The peanut M&Ms are good over here. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, while the minor minority leader is looking, um, this underlying bill has uh, several uh, concerning provisions. Uh, and uh, I just want to just mention for one uh, provision related to net neutrality. And um, before I go further in discussion, I wanted to see if Representative Kraft would yield. I'm sorry, did you ask somebody to yield? Yes, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Kraft. Representative Schultz, he will yield. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Kraft, do we have instances of people in Minnesota being negatively impacted because net neutrality is not the law of the land in Minnesota? Representative Kraft. Madam Speaker, Representative Schultz, uh, I went through this in committee, I'd have to go through my notes, but several years ago there were instances of AT&T and Sprint doing things that would have uh, negatively impacted people around the country. So I imagine, yes, there were folks in Minnesota that were negatively impacted. Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the facts of the matter are uh, that when this bill moved through the committee process, there were no examples in Minnesota where any business has throttled the service to residents and to ratepayers across the state. And so right now we have a piece of legislation uh, called net neutrality that is going to hamper, hamper businesses seeking to provide a quality service to Minnesota consumers. And I'm concerned that this provision, especially if it stood on its own, especially if it was only a Minnesota way about going about this, would add to the costs and the fees that Minnesotans would have to pay. And we already know that the bills that have passed this body in 2023 and 2024 are incredibly irresponsible and exceedingly unaffordable for Minnesotans. And now, now we're trying to add more regulation to something super important for people, their access to the internet, and we're doing that, which is going to result in higher costs, higher costs for Minnesotans to access the internet because of additional regulations, more burdensome regulations, when Minnesotans have not been negatively impacted by the way that the internet is currently regulated. So. This is unnecessary language. And if it stood on, on its own, it would be a complete outlier to the rest of the nation. And that's not a good way to set up our policy. In addition, the FCC is currently taking action on this and plans to make a decision in April. So I'm glad and I'm grateful that Representative Kraft supported my amendment in committee to ensure that this doesn't go into effect until January 1st of 2025. However, members, this is an irresponsible and unaffordable policy if it were to stand on its own. And that is why it shouldn't be included in this bill. The member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members, for a robust discussion tonight on various topics in the uh, Commerce Policy Bill. Um, there is a lot of work that still needs to be done on this particular piece of legislation. And um, I have no idea who the conferees are going to be on this uh, particular conference committee. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my, um, my wish list for Minnesota together as to what needs to be worked on on here. Homework assignments for those who are going to be on that conference committee. First and foremost, um, I'd like to go back to the telecom bill. Um, I'm not going to ask anyone to yield on this. I'm just going to, again, if you will, hand out assignments on things that really need to be addressed that Minnesotans will have some concern on. 
Um, one of the provisions that we didn't talk about, the telecom or steal your phone company, um, is there's also a $25 fee or charge in this bill that if um, someone who needs to be able to have access uh, to their phone because of medical uh, condition and the like calls for service and the phone company does not show up, they owe the customer an automatic $25 credit on their bill. The part that I find interesting in this piece of legislation are the same things I raised in committee, which were there are no explanations <clears throat> in here or, or how to address if the person responding to do the repairs felt the environment was unsafe. Perhaps there were animals that were out in the yard or out on the premises that the individual didn't feel uh, their safety was, was being preserved. Does that constitute a $25 uh, credit? Does that constitute a $25 credit on the bill as well? Um, I think we really need to address what kinds of conditions uh, result in that $25 credit. We also have language in here, um, thankfully, that the 8% franchise fee or tax was taken out of this bill. Um, as relates to debt collectors, all right, as it relates to debt collectors on this, um, I hope we can get some work done on this um, four to $5,000 uh, in an account. You will not be able to garnish if you are a, um, uh, uh, someone owed money or were under debt collection if you had a bank account that had less than $5,000 in that account. This can become a, a shell game where you can be moving things around constantly and avoid uh, paying debt. So I hope that that gets, gets addressed and resolved. There are some other uh, provisions in the bill that I have some concerns about. It relates to the contract for deed language. Um, worked very closely with, um, with folks and stakeholders on this. The part that I find interesting on this is we really haven't protected contractor builders, home providers, those who are building a new, a new housing stock for us here in the state of Minnesota. Um, some work needs to be done to be able to make sure those folks um, are properly treated under this bill as well. And so to wrap on, on uh, some other provisions that I think are good provisions that we can all agree on, um, I like the idea of the kiosk notice, particularly when we're talking about Bitcoin. We're moving in the right direction. A lot of people don't know what Bitcoin is and that it's very volatile as a, uh, as a cyber currency and what that does. Everyone also wants to protect our children and others who are vulnerable, so I appreciate the work on the social media uh, aspect. And there were some very good non-controversial provisions that made this bill um, through work with the uh, department and with other stakeholders. And so, um, again, this is a, a, a homework list that still needs to be done. And members, I would encourage a no vote tonight on this bill, and uh, hopefully we can get this into conference committee with our Senate counterparts and get a bill that is actually going to be workable and is good for Minnesotans. Members vote no. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Anoka, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. Uh, I will be brief since the hour is late and just say thank you to all the members who have provisions in this bill for your excellent work from both sides of the aisle. Thanks for the uh, discussion tonight. Thanks to all the members of the committee. Uh, regardless if they have something in the bill, I appreciate that. We have a finance bill coming, so I won't go through all of the staff, but I do want to take a moment just to say that we have truly excellent staff, both partisan and nonpartisan here, without whom we would be completely lost. And I am always grateful to them. And with that, members, I'd ask for a yes vote on the bill tonight. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. Members, please vote. <laughs> Members, please vote. Will the clerk please call the name of the member who is voting remotely? Keeler. Keeler votes aye. Keeler votes aye. The clerk will close the roll.
There being 70 ayes and 61 nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to.